the message made. Thank you for being with us today. You were a member of the Danish Parliament, now you are a member of the European Parliament. Which is the difference between a national parliament and the European Parliament? Well, I think that the fundamental necessity for a democracy is that you have a people to represent, a demos, so to speak, being the core element of demos and kratos. Uh, and I don't really see that there is any European demos. Uh, we are a lot of different people with a lot of different uh, opinions and cultures and, and, and languages and other things that on the one side, of course, keep us together since we have a common history, and, but, but on the other side also puts some limitations to how much true democracy you can have in such a, a forum as a European uh, Parliament. So, uh, so that's the major difference, I think, the concept of democracy between the two uh, bodies, where there was in the Danish parliament an immediate and direct um, approach to the voters. Uh, we understood each other, we might not agree with it in any matter, but we understood where we were. Whereas in being in the European parliament, um, uh, sometimes I have no clue what's going on in many of the, many of the bigger uh, states, and I have no ability neither to understand nor to influence the discussion there, even though these People, the voters, for instance, in Bulgaria or Poland or Ireland or wherever, are quite influential on them, the majority within the parliament. And then, uh, also seen from inside, there are some uh, major differences. Of course, in the Danish parliament, we have a system of parliamentarism. Uh, that's uh, not a thing that is practiced at all in the European parliament. Even though it's called a parliament, there's no parliamentarism, uh, because the commission is, is elected not by the parliament, but by the member states, um, or appointed rather than elected. Um, and furthermore, uh, if you see many of the minority uh, protection rights you have for opposition groups, as I would define myself, in the Danish parliament, uh, those, uh, those things are now existing in the European parliament. Um, uh, speaking rights, the right to presenting alternative suggestions, and all these areas are uh, things or places where I would talk about a, a democratic deficit within the way that the European parliament works. So from the overall perspective, it's uh, it's a cultural shock, you could say, going from a, what I would call a true parliament, the Danish one, or the ones working in the United States, and then to this uh, superficial, or I would even say superfluous, uh, parliament we have in Brussels, and Strasbourg, by the way. So, in your opinion, there is no European people? No, I think there are many European peoples, uh, but not one. Uh, and that's basically what you need in order to build a democracy. You need to have the confidence and the understanding which is within a people with a common language, common history, common culture, and so on. Um, uh, trying to, to, to make the illusion that you have that in, in Europe will, uh, will remain an, an illusion. Uh, and I think that's one of the reasons why you see that the, that the turnout in the European elections is you know, increasingly going down. One of the good things about the election in 2009 was actually that the majority of the Europeans choose not to participate. I think that's very encouraging from a, from, a, from a democratic point of view because the European Parliament is a democratic farce. Uh, so, so that the majority of the Europeans actually turned down to participate in this farce, I think it was a good step for democracy. So the European Parliament, does it represent all European people or does not? Oh no, it no, does not, not at all. I mean, first of all, the majority, as I just mentioned, of the Europeans didn't even uh, choose to, to, to participate in putting the, put the Parliament together. Secondly, if you see all the crucial issues on the institutions, uh, on the institutions or the institutional changes of the EU system when it comes to the Schengen, uh, new treaties, um, uh, all these areas, uh, there is there's a huge support in the parliament among the parliamentarians in order to increase uh, the, the level of power integration in Brussels, develop what Barroso recently called the, the federation among member states, um, whereas each time you put it to the public referendum, as we saw it in, in, in the Netherlands with the, uh, the constitutional treaty, we saw it in France. We also saw it in Denmark actually in the 90s from the, and 2000 when we rejected the euro. Um, then there is uh, quite a reluctance, or you might even say um, skepticism within the population. So there are huge differences between what the, the peoples of Europe want and then what this uh, minority elected group that is in Brussels, that they are in the direction they're driving. Uh, the European Commission wants to facilitate the privatization of public water supply. This could, could force Austrian communities to privatize their water supply. How can the Austrian people defend themselves against this pressure? Well, first of all, um, 
I very much agree that that's a thing you need to de defend yourself against because when it comes to our crucial infrastructure, not only water supplies but also like airports or fac facilitating uh, energy supplies or or even the highways, I think it's crucial that that cannot be bought by a private company of which you have no control whatsoever. Um, uh, it, it's important that these are these issues which are of importance to all citizens in the country are on on on, the, on, uh, on public hands, so to speak. I very much fear, for instance, that uh, that uh, Gazprom or uh, some Arabic uh, company bought up Danish uh, energy uh, production company, for instance. Um, and the same thing goes, of course, when it comes to water supplies. So the second part of the question is, what can we do about it? Um, and there are several things. First of all, of course, we need to fight it politically. Um, the Commission, I think, is not as strong as it has been. The Commission does know that that uh, the, the, the foundation of the, the union is trembling. Uh, and therefore there are, uh, I think, good chances in such a core issue. So I argue that this, uh, this uh, uh, very ideological uh, liberalism is a no-go for us. We don't want it. Um, and instruct uh, the commissioner who was appointed by, uh, by Austria that this is a core issue for, for Austria, that you don't want this. I know that the commissioner, of course, cannot take dictate from, from, the, from the time being government, but at least if there is a general consensus among the parties that this is a bad idea, it should be instructed or it communicates commission directly from your uh, local authorities, from your national parliament and, and, and government. Then, of course, you have strong members in the European parliament, like Igor Stadler, one of my good friends and colleagues, um, who I, I am sure would advocate the same uh, view as I have. And within the process where the Parliament, the European Parliament, is to uh, set this uh, deal, it's important, it's important that, uh, that he is supported uh, by as many people as possible in, uh, in, uh, here in the um, well, canton, but also, of course, in, uh, in Austria in general. And I think a good way of doing that, of course, would be here at the local elections in, in March, simply to support the parties that, that host that line. And how will the Danish people react to these plans to privatize water supply? Well, I hope that they will uh, agree uh, that it's not a good idea. Uh, actually, I think in the, in the Thatcher area, of the, uh, of, uh, in, the, in the 80s of Britain, we saw that there was a huge wave of privatization of uh, crucial infrastructure, water supplies, uh, energy supplies, and, and other areas. And now we see that uh, it didn't go well. Uh, many of those companies who at that time bought it from the state uh, have either gone bankrupt or they're, they're living in a poorer product than they used to, uh, that the Brits used to have. So that's a scary enough example of what might happen. Um, and, and, uh, and I am quite convinced that if the Danes have a say on this, um, they will reject it. I'm also fairly convinced that they will not have a say because the, 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 the majority of the, of the parliamentarian parties are so loyal uh, to the European Union that they will never ask for a referendum, none of this on such, an era, uh, on such a topic, um, but uh, hopefully they'll be influenced equally from their, uh, from their constituencies and, and, and the people around the country, uh, not just to accept this. What feelings did you have last December when the European Union received the Nobel Prize for Peace? <laughs> well, I didn't know whether I should laugh or cry. <laughs> um, <laughs> laughing, of course, because you know, if I, if I should be a little bit uh, ironic here, or uh, sarcastic maybe, um, I'd say that nobody deserves it more than the European Union, because after giving it to Al Gore for making junk science and to, uh, to, to, um, to Arafat, uh, a well-known terrorist, and then even Obama before he even become president, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's becoming the, the habit to give it to people who don't deserve it. So, so in, that, in that respect, it might be a good idea to give it to the Union. Seriously speaking, I think it's extremely ironic uh, that in the time where the Euro project has uh, created a lot of turmoil, and maybe even situations that, that resemble uh, civil wars in some of the uh, southern European states, you know, what I see in Athens right now is, is very scary. I think that, that was something that we didn't hope to have in, a, in the European continent, uh, people in, in, in severe fights with the, with the public authorities. Um, because of this austerity policy that is necessary, if you need to uh, keep all the member states within the within the euro, um, it's it's ironic then in that state of time and mind, uh, choosing to give the EU the, uh, the the Nobel Peace Prize. If somebody, some political organ, uh, wants to have the Nobel 
peace prize. I think it would be much fairer to give it to NATO, for instance. I know that Austria is, is, is a neutral country, but, uh, but at least to my country, which is not neutral as such, um, it, we should have been in certain areas of time, but certainly we have not chosen so. Um, NATO has been the organization that's kept the peace in Europe or the transatlantic cooperation um, during the Soviet uh, times, during the Cold War. I think, therefore, NATO would be a more obvious uh, um, um, receiver of the, of the peace prize. Um, and in some way, it, it resembles the frustration, I think, not only of the European Union to see that Barroso and Boy and Schulz and all our other un unelected leaders from commission and so on go to, uh, to Stockholm to receive this in Oslo. Um, but, uh, but I think it also resembles the, um, what did you say, um, uh, feeling of despair within the elite of the uh, Nobel uh, Committee. Because the Norwegians are you know, constantly re rejecting the pressure from this elite to become a member of the European Union. So what can this elite do just to show that they are bon uh, Well, of course, they can hand over the prize to the Union. So I think there are two sides in this uh, matter. But overall, no, I, I think it's ridiculous and undeserved. It's a good marketing for the European Union. <laughs> it's better marketing for the Union than it is for the Nobel Peace Prize Committee, I would say. Imagine the United Kingdom leaves the European Union. Which consequences would appear? Well, Cameron gave a very uh, strong speech the other day, and um, and as I see it and understand it, he's now bringing two alternatives. Is if he's going to be re-elected in 2015, uh, either you can leave the union, or you can have a more flexible way of working together, where there'll be less areas where the UK has uh, handed over sovereignty. Um, I think and I hope that the Brits will uh, stay within the union, but in a more flexible way, where they, for instance, get more. Of the, what some of their sovereignties on labor market and social affairs back, um, that that'll be that'll be a good way to settle it and thereby also to to to, to dealing with the with the skepticism among the Brits. Um, what is, from my perspective, important, and I think from from an Austrian point of view as well, is that after this speech, that I think will be a turning point in the European debate. Um, it's not about either being 100% member of the Union or entirely out. That's also what that's always what we have been uh, accused of in my past when we point out critiques of, of the union. Uh, our opponents will say, "Well, you just want to leave everything and don't want to work together and so on." But now there's actually a a, a, a way of, of being in between of these two extremes, 100% with or zero percent. Now Cameron has Cameron has has introduced um, the possibility of maybe in some areas um, participating 100%, but in other areas not at all. Uh, and I think that's going to be great. I think that's going to be a, a, a European Union which is not going to be more efficient, thereby uh, in a position to tackle some of the challenges that Europe undeniably has in a global world, but also uh, will be able to embrace the population in a way that's never done before. Because some states in Europe might dream, or all of the populations might dream, of a federation like the Rosen family does. I mean, I don't know whether the Portuguese follow the Rosen or that. If they do, let them have it. I mean, I will not stand in the way for a, a federation uh, among Portugal, Spain, and the French, if that's what they want. But I'm quite convinced that the Danes and the Finns and the Swedes, they don't want to be a part of the federation. So, does that mean that we could do nothing together? Of course not. It just means that there must be certain levels of integration. And that, I think, a more flexible way of working together, where you respect the differences uh, in, uh, in the, among the member states and the, 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 you could say the commitment of integration among the, among the different peoples in the states, that's a great thing that you begin now to respect that instead of just doing as the Commission has been doing for now tens and tens of years, uh, just ignoring the, the, pouring, uh, the, the growing skepticism uh, in, the, in the population. So in that sense, I think that Cameron's speech was a good thing, a good step forward for Europe. Actually, I think he's done, with that one speech, more for democracy than any of the 26 other leaders has done for democracy for the past 10 years. Um, but, but, of course, it also opens the possibility of UK leaving uh, uh, EU. I don't think that would be a disaster to the UK. Um, but uh, but uh, for me, also representing a smaller country than, than the UK, uh, the idea of having an alternative between the two 
experience of 100% or zero percent, it's very attractive. So, from a narrow, you know, point of point of view, from my own perspective, I hope that it will be possible to to renegotiate and settle on that thing. Do you see any chance to change the Lisbon Treaty in a way that there is a more flexible cooperation, just like you just described? Well, the uh, the nobility of, of Brussels, if you could call it so, I mean, the Commission and the um, and the Parliament, the majority and so on, they have certainly shown that you can change the Lisbon Treaty since they've done so um, multiple times since it was uh, taken into force in uh, December 2009. First, by the uh, by the uh, by the threshold of how many, how many members you could have the Parliament, and secondly, uh, more importantly, also on the on the uh, general liability to other Euro countries and their debt and so on. Uh, so you can certainly change it. The relevant question which you pose is, of course, can you change it in the other direction, going for less power to Brussels? And that's going to be interesting to see, but, you know, uh, when Rompuy recently uh, brought out this um, blueprint of his, and when Barroso um, talked about his federation, and the papers we now have from the, from the Commission and the Council, it's obvious that they will need to change the uh, treaty. There will come a new treaty, and that treaty obviously will be the foundation for the federation. I don't know what it will be called, but it will be a new treaty. And negotiating that treaty, Britain has the right to veto. Um, and if Britain she vetoes, there's nothing that Barroso of the 26 countries can do about it. Of course, politically, you can put pressure on another country, but at the end of the day, why should 26 countries, if it be so, insist on Britain either leaving or accepting a treaty they don't want just uh, for, having, for having their treaty. I mean, why shouldn't they, in that situation where Britain actually has you know, the strong, strong uh, uh, position, why shouldn't they accept them that Britain gets some opt-outs? Opt-outs are normal in the European Union. My country has four of them. We get, we're not in the, in, the, in the Euro. We have an opt-out on on the, on the defense uh, area chapter of the treaty and the, um, and the homeland security chapter, uh, the, the previous uh, pillars two and three. So uh, there we have our, uh, our opt-outs. Why not grant opt-outs to Britain? Um, already now, I mean, 10 of the 27 countries, soon to be 28, uh, are, are outside of the Euro. So it's, it's not a new thing that you have different levels of inspiration. So in the situation where, where I guess Germany and France and other countries will push for a new treaty and more power to Brussels, and Britain will have the right to veto. They'll be forced to give Cameron what he uh, what he asks for, and uh, hopefully in Denmark again, you know, representing uh, uh, Denmark, uh, that's my, my core interest. But also, I would say in Austria and other countries, I hope that the uh, the governments in power at that time will have the respect, self-respect, decency to ask their populations what they will desire instead of just saying that we need to be 100% within this union. I mean, this union is not delivering the results which we were told. I mean, you, the EU is losing market shares in the global market day by day and week by week. So it's not so that this is the, the sole and, and, and ever-solving uh, um, uh, solution for any of our problems. If it were so, then we could argue. Okay, we might have to do this, but it's not. I mean, the European Union is probably creating more problems than it's giving solutions. Uh, and in that respect, I think it's fair when you argue that this union that's created so many problems now has to have more authority than you ask the people. During the January plenary session, the Austrian Chancellor Werner Feynman held a speech in the European Parliament in Strasbourg. Do you share his points of view? Honestly, I must say I did not have a chance to hear his speech. Uh, so uh, it will be difficult for me to, um, to, to respond directly uh, to it. But if you could mention some of them. Well, in a sentence, he just defended the whole concept of Europe and also he, uh, he described the solution of the financial crisis. So in his opinion, um, we there is no crisis anymore because the European Union uh, has won the fight against the financial problems. Well, it's an interesting point of view, isn't it? I think maybe he should try to give that speech in Athens, or in Lisbon, or in Madrid, where the youth and unemployment just turned 60%. Well, let's hope that somebody will, 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 will take
take care of his security. Anyway, that just says it all, that it might be so that seeing from uh, you know, the Commission, some of the governing parties and so on, the euro crisis is over, the market are stable, and the stock markets will have been developing positively for the first month of 2013 and so on. But out in the real life, where it really matters for the people living under this euro regime, the crisis is certainly not over. It might not even have topped yet. Um, and you have people, of course predominantly in, in southern European countries, but also problems emerging in, in, in the middle, uh, in the middle uh, region, you say in France for instance. You have people now being unemployed for so many years, having no chance whatsoever, or they're not likely to get any jobs because the economy is still, uh, still very, very um, un uncertain. The only uh, solution that they are being told from, from Brussels is further uh, austerity. Um, and I don't see that uh, as a situation where it's either prudent nor morally uh, uh, defensible to talk about the euro crisis being over. Um, we've also seen Barroso talking about it, and Rand Poy talking about it, and it appears that they think that if they just echo each other, then they can change the reality uh, of, 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 of the world, but they can't. I mean, they, they're trying to to speak up uh, some positive sentiment, but it's not going to happen. I mean, the markets are way, way too bright to, to fall for this. Um, and I am, uh, I must say that I think it's an ignorance uh, and arrogance that we probably have not seen in Europe, um, well, I can't even rem remember since when, uh, that just for an ideological reason, these people maintain in their protected, you know, glasses, uh, palaces of glasses in Brussels, they maintain this idea that the euro must be preserved, in despite of the fact that it has huge, huge human uh, impacts and, and, and consequences. And I think it's just from any perspective, it's 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 awful. Uh, it's obvious that countries like Greece and Spain and others, who have had it as an an, an active tool to devalue it each time there was an imbalance between there and the German economy. If you take that tool away, uh, the consequences will be enormous. Uh, and just to think that because the ideology of Europe, the ideology of Europe is the euro is good, uh, you can ignore the human consequences. It's such an arrogance that I don't really know the, the, the right term to use. Um, and if that's the speaking of your chancellor, uh, I must say that that I had called me naive. I had higher hopes for, for Austria than that. In Austrian media, media they said uh, concerning the finance speech, oh, it's such an honor to be invited to Parliament in Strasbourg. And the deputies, in, in the members of the European Parliament in Strasbourg, um, they said, oh, it's such an honor that there is a, a chancellor coming to us. So uh, everyone pointed out it's an honor to be here, but... <laughs> hmm. Well, I don't know how much of an honor it is. Um, I don't want to enter into any argument with your chancellor. But, uh, but uh, uh, it's quite common, you know, to have foreign or foreign leaders or leaders from other EU countries to, to address the, uh, the crowd in the, in the plenary. Um, what I think you should do, and this I say without actually knowing the answer, it's always very dangerous for politicians to, to, to pose a question without knowing the answer, but what you should do is to check on the internet how many parliamentarians were actually there. And I'll tell you why, because you mentioned early on when, when the Union got the Nobel Peace Prize. And I've been you know, hearing for weeks and weeks how great this was. Danish media, and European media, and French, and German, and English, and all of them. So I thought to myself, all right, I'll go down to the plenary. I was in Strasbourg when, when this official ceremony was there. I went down, and it was almost empty. I mean, this manifest event, apparently, um, didn't even attract the, the, the people to the plenary when it was being celebrated. And I think that said more than, than a thousand words. So if it is such an honor, well, try to check the internet and see uh, on, the, on the streamed uh, video how many were actually there to then participate in this honor. My guess would be that it would be fairly limited. But again, that's more to do, I think, with the European conception, because where it's all about uh, shine rather than Zion. Yes, yeah. speaking uh, rough, rough German, um, uh, that is more to do with the EU system than with uh, with uh, with your country. So.
So as a member of the EFD, you maybe could explain to us why the Austrian Freedom Party so far is not a member of the EFD. You know, when we, in 2009, after the elections, formed the European Freedom and Democracy Group, um, we had many uh, applications from, from other parties, um, among others the FPO. Uh, and uh, I took upon me also to get to know these people. I, I hadn't met them before and I felt, all right, let's see what they are like. Um, I knew, of course, the reputation from the saying, but on the other hand, you know that uh, any conservative party advocating, advocating in favor of your of a national state and so on would be screened out to be racist and xenophobic and one that, whatever. So you can never really trust any rumor. But after getting further into this party um, and seeing uh, their their total uh, neglect uh, of the uh, of the policies from the 40s to the 40 to 45, um, to see the behavior of especially Strafe, um posting uh, on Facebook. Pictures of uh, well, people can look for themselves, but that that are that are things that I thought actually belong to a past that we should not forget, but we should definitely turn our backs to. Um, I just came to the to the to the conclusion that this party does not belong in, in any fraction where I am, um, and luckily that view is shared by by the vast vast majority of the EFT group. Um, that being said. Um, Bizeru, uh, which I think has a very, very good representative in, in Brussels by uh, Igor Stadler, uh, I would very much welcome in the EFT fraction. This is something that we discuss uh, very, sometimes very enthusiastically within the group. Um, and uh, I think everybody will know, or at least if they don't know, they could check it out and thereby know it, that the Italians have a strong affiliation to the FPO. And apparently Italian politics is more <laughs> flexible uh, than, than, uh, than other countries' uh, policies. And that's fair. I mean, we, as I said before, we have differences and so on. But when it comes to the FPO and their uh, way of presenting themselves, constantly flirting with something from the, from the Nazi period and some uh, things like that, I think it's disgusting. Uh, and uh, I will certainly not have my name on it. Uh, so I veto it. Um, but I'm not the only one who beats us. I think we have, out of the 10 or the 11 delegations in the group, and we have discussed it, I mean, there was only one or two who ever said that it would not be a problem. Um, so, uh, so uh, as I see it, that's how it is. You know, of course we can, we can have differences, but there must also be a core that keeps us together. And therefore, to me, uh, parties like uh, Jopic, in Hungary, um, Front National, uh, FPO, that I think belong to the same family. That's that's just another planet. I mean, there must be some some uh, fundamental uh, uh, shared democratic and freedom values uh, that we must have in common. And we simply don't have that with the FPO. Having something in common, um, it is also valuable for, for the European peoples. Which is the common thing, the common values of Europe? Because um, Turkey people, they also would like to join the European yeah. Union, um, but so far they didn't um, because of different problems. Mm -hmm. um, but what is the identity of Europe? Well, very basically, I think it's what came out of the Renaissance uh, and, uh, and uh, the beginning of of actually separating the religious and the secular powers, uh, where uh, of course you, we for a long time we had monarchies that, that claimed the power from God and so on. But in the uh, but in the very thinking of the uh, of the society and the way that afterwards the, the free constitutions were written and so on, there's a clear separation uh, among the relig religious world and the and the, the secular world. Um, that I think in, in keeps us together. That way of looking upon the world and that's developed the. The Magna Carta and the uh, ideas of individual freedom rights for the for the for every citizen and, and, and so on, um, and that of course uh, totally contradicts with the with the Muslim world here also Turkey, which though 
as probably the only uh, losing power in 1918 actually benefited from, from, from being on the losing side because what that led to, of course, was the, was the downfall of the Caliphate, Caliphate and um, uh, then the Kemalism. And uh, Kemal Atatürk was a great guy for, for Turkey, who forced a democratic process, um, which I think has benefited Turkey compared to other Muslim countries. Yet what we see nowadays is that uh, the Kemalism itself uh, is under a huge internal pressure uh, from, uh, from the neo-Islamists uh, uh, like uh, uh, Dehuklu, uh, Gül, uh, Erdogan and, uh, and others, um, who with uh, various ways, um, the deep states and other ways, have been, have been able to uh, re-Islamize uh, many of the authorities within the, uh, the Turkish uh, state. Um, so just from, from, from that period of time, the last 10 years, it's quite, cl quite clear that the fundamental division uh, of religion on the one hand and then the, the secular and civil society on the other hand doesn't exist in a country like Turkey. It, it, it's simply not in accordance with any uh, you know, uh, ways of reading uh, Islam. Uh, their politics and religion is one. Um, so you could say that, that the time after Kemal Atatürk and then until the development in the beginning of the 90s, where, by the way, everyone was convicted for you know, promoting uh, Islamist propaganda, um, and I think he even served time in jail. That time of, what, 80 years or so, is, is uh, the exception, uh, whereas the time of the Caliphate and now the time of the uh, of Gül and others, uh, I think can be seen as uh, the natural, uh, there is a natural connection between them. And of course in that light, um, Turkey doesn't belong within the European family, it doesn't belong within the European Union. It's one of the, uh, I think, uh, strange things of the end of First World War that um, the western part of the Bosphorus Strait was not, uh, was not uh, uh, dealt with in another way. Um, then the question, of course, is what do we do with Turkey? I mean, Turkey has some obvious advantages. They have economic growth rates that are unseen in, in the European Union, and, and of course they have few resources and so on. We could not just turn our backs to Turkey. Um, but I think we should try to settle our relationships with Turkey in a way which is more uh, in accordance with reality and, and the real possibilities than, than negotiating for a membership that everybody knows uh, that will never happen. So instead, I think we should negotiate on, on how do we do commerce together, or how can we exchange students together, and things like that. Um, that, I think, will be mutually uh, beneficial uh, and <laughs> at least more realistic. Um, and also in, co in, in coherence with the vast majority of the European state. Um, as I understand it, uh, your former Chancellor um, Schüssel uh, uh, asked for a public referendum here in Austria. Uh, when it, if it ever came to that, that you could you could conclude a negotiation. I think that's fair, especially since the Austrians was the last uh, you know power rejecting uh, by by force the, the Turks. Um, the same uh, promise has been given to the French. Um, everybody knows that the French and the, and the Austrians will reject this. So why negotiate for something that? then in the best of all days can only be you know, a disappointment. Um, I think it's very important to, 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 when you negotiate something to be realistic. And the realistic thing is certainly for Turkey is certainly not membership. Um, it's, I think even the associated agreement they have now is a problem because of the, uh, the, the privileged rights to migration that Turks have and Turkish families have. Um, so we need to settle in another way and that could be done not, only, not necessarily bilaterally but, but also multilaterally between the EU and, and Turkey but focusing on areas where we could uh, have mutual benefit uh, rather than just, you know, dreaming some wild, crazy, multi-ethical dreams. As Brussels is certainly true. <laughs> Although in Brussels, if you see the daily life there, there is no uh, multicultural society than rather criminals. Brussels is a strange place to be, you know. Um, Twenty percent, as I understand, of the population there is Muslim, and they have some quite uh, fundamentalistic members elected within the city councils of, of Brussels. Um, but uh, of course, the commissioners and highly paid civil servants and so on, uh, they never realize that. I mean, they, are, they, they live in their own wealth ghettos, uh, not realizing the, the consequences of their policies. 
Um, that's why the lack of democracy in the EU is such a danger. Because normally, uh, in, a, in a true democracy, when people, uh, when people get the chance to vote, they will respond in accordance with reality. Uh, and people around Europe are getting increasingly frustrated about the consequences in crime and social, uh, social costs and so on due to the, to the migration from the Muslim world. But, um, but how do you react if you can't vote? I mean, how do you reject a leader that is unelected? It's impossible. And that might build up tensions, uh, I think, to a, to a collapse uh, that will not be the best for Europe. I think the best would be to bring the leaders in accordance with the voters, rather than them just you know, trying to, 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 to use, uh, use uh, Europe as a sort of a laboratory of experiments, as they are right now. Should we fear uh, some kind of civil war in Europe during the next 10 or 20 years? You should always fear civil war and uh, you should definitely do it with a greater reason today than for 20 years ago. 